Hello again, everybody. This is Pastor Tony, and welcome to lesson number 21 of our series, On Purpose. We're looking at the God-given purpose for our life. Yes, God knew before the foundation of the world that you were going to be born. There are no accidents born into the earth. God knew about you before he ever created the first man and put him in the Garden of Eden. And yes, he knew when you were going to be born. He knew where you were going to be born. And he already devised a plan and a purpose for us. Now again, that's twofold. We share a general calling and purpose with Jesus, the head of the church, because we're in identification with him. We're in him. So of course, we are children of God. We're offspring of God. We're also heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. And we share so many things with Jesus. But also there is a unique, specific calling and purpose for your life. God knew where you were going to be born, when you were going to be born, and he also knew how you were going to fit into that master plan that he had created before the foundation of the world. And so he devised all of this. Now, the problem is not trying to come up with a plan for your life. You know, a lot of people spend the majority of their life sometimes trying to figure out what they're supposed to be doing, and they're dissatisfied most of their life. Some never ever find out what that is and never really are fulfilled and satisfied in life. But we don't have to be like that because God has given us some methods and means from his word and by the spirit of God where you can know exactly where you're supposed to fit in, what you're supposed to be doing. And of course, that's going to give you the greatest fulfillment and satisfaction in life. There, the, money can't buy that. I mean, money cannot buy this kind of satisfaction that you get only from fulfilling your unique place and calling and position in life. Now, when we're talking about a God-given purpose and plan for our life, a calling that comes from Him, that is a God-sized plan and purpose. Therefore, we're going to have to have some God-sized help in order to, first of all, know that plan and how to fulfill that plan, how to run our race, like Paul said, and finish it with joy. Well, thank God that we weren't left helpless down here. We've been lo looking at the last couple of lessons, how when Jesus was about to depart, he actually was about to go to the cross to become sin for us, pay the sin debt off, and then, uh, of course, die on the cross, be buried, and then the third day be re resurrected from the dead. And eventually he ascended back to the throne uh, to sit at the right hand of God. But he didn't just let, leave us down here orphans, he said. He said, I'm not going to leave you down here orphans or helpless, comfortless. He said, I'm going to send you another helper. And this is over in John chapter 14. We already looked at that. Another helper, not, that word another means another of the same exact kind. In other words, he had been their helper all along, but now he was about to go back to be with his father, and he was sending another helper of the same kind to do the same things in our life. In fact, he went on to say later on, he says, it's to your advantage that I go away. He said, for if I don't go away, the comforter will not come. Well, you have to remember when Jesus was walking on the earth, he was limited geographically, positionally, because of a physical body. But now he's in heaven and he sent another helper what was the advantage of this other helper? Well, he wouldn't just be on the outside of us, geographically limited and confined to a physical body. He would actually come and indwell us. That's what Jesus talked about. Now, that word helper there is the Greek word parakletos. It means one called alongside to help. Now, he's not going to do it for us. And I say he because we're referring to the Holy Spirit, the person of the Spirit of the living God, the third person in the Godhead. And when we're talking about this parakletos, he's, he's called alongside to help you. And I tell you what a help he is. Now, he's not going to do it for you. You still have to carry out. You still have to make the right decisions, walk the right way. But he's going to be involved in our life, in every aspect of our life, as much as we will yield to him and allow him. Now, he's a gentleman. He's not going to take uh, any part of your life that you don't submit or yield to him by faith. But anything and everything where you look to him and submit to him and his leadership, he's there to help. And I tell you, he knows infinitely more than any of us. He knows exactly 
In fact, he even knows your future. J Jesus said he will lead and guide you into all truth and show you things to come. And you know, those things to come, he knows. He knows by the foreknowledge of God. He's He's the spirit of the living God. He knows exactly what the future holds. And he also knows how to take the steps to overcome, how to deal with it, how to, how to, how to get around or through that so that we can, again, finish our race and the plan and purpose of God in our life. Now, we said a lot of things in the last couple of lessons, and if you missed those, you really need to go back and listen to those, uh, the last two lessons. In fact, you need to go back and listen to all of it, <laughs> all the way from lesson one eventually, because that's going to do you the most good. But we, we really said a lot of things about this helper, the Holy Spirit, that I think are vitally important for us in, in receiving his help in our life. Because, you know, Jesus looked around at his disciples and said, man, y'all need some help. But he, he also looked at us. He looked at me. And he said, man, he's going to need some help. So thank God that he sent another helper, just like what Jesus did when he was walking on the earth. And even more advantageous because this, the Spirit of God dwells on the inside of us. But we also referred to a second working of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. The first working, of course, happens at the new birth. He comes to indwell us. He comes to live on the inside of us, to be our teacher, our guide, our strengthener, our stamina, all those things. But there's a second working of the Holy Spirit that we also referred to and looked at from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. How that they received the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And again, there's going to be a link at the bottom of this uh, lesson today if... I, I did about an hour-long teaching on how to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You need that. I tell you, when I found out about this, I said, where has this been? I, you know, I'd been born again for 10 years, and, and I didn't know anything about any of this stuff. And boy, what a difference it made in my life. I tell you, the Word of God just exploded after that in Revelation as I began to yield to the Holy Spirit in that infilling uh, arena. But you're going to need this. I tell you, I, I knew what I was going to need all the help I could get. So I wanted everything that God was giving, that, that Jesus was offering to me. And I knew I needed to develop that partnership, that cooperation with the Holy Spirit early in life, not only for my own life, but for the ministry I was called to do. And whatever, when we refer to ministry, it's whatever you're called to do as well. You're going to need some supernatural help in order to deal with this stuff. You know, our adversary... Uh, the devil, even though he is a defeated foe, Jesus whipped and stripped him 2,000 years ago in his death, burial, resurrection. He has been disarmed, defeated, and dethroned, but he still operates in that unseen spiritual realm. And to that degree, because of that, he can still uh, hold an advantage over us many times in, in trying to hinder the plan of God and trying to discourage us and all those kind of things. But, you know, this gives us the advantage right here. You know, when we receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit, that's going to give us an advantage over him. Because even though you're a believer, even though Satan is defeated, if you're just operating from the natural standpoint, just from your own natural limitations of your flesh and of your mind, and, you know, again, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, we know in part. I mean, he said that. I mean, how much less do we know than that? He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. But, you know, it doesn't matter how much you personally know. If you know the Holy Spirit and you have that cooperative partnership with Him, you're hooked up with the mind of God. You know all things. You have access to the very knowledge of God Himself, the, the very wisdom and the understanding of God. You have access to the very strength and the power of God. In fact, you know, when Jesus was, uh, when he had uh, res been resurrected and he had said some things to his disciples right before his ascension back to heaven, and one of these things he said, this is the very first thing that he told them to do before they went out and started winning the world, doing mission trips and winning the lost and all those kind of things. This is what he instructed them to do. In uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 49, he said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Now that again is referring to the Holy Spirit. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. That word endued right there in the Greek actually means to be clothed with. 
In other words, you need to wear this power. Now, that is really indicative and distinctive to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Whereas the first working of the Holy Spirit, he comes to indwell us. The second working, he comes upon us. He comes upon us and we receive power. In fact, Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, he said, you shall receive power, dynamis power, dynamite power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. So that is distinctive to the receiving the infilling of the Holy Spirit is you're receiving that dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. That is creative power. That's the power that the Holy Spirit used to create the heavens and the earth and also to raise Jesus from the dead. But see, that power, when he comes upon you and in the infilling, we like to say, then that, that power also comes upon you. That's what Jesus was talking about. Now, he was referring to both of those scriptures, looking ahead to the day of Pentecost that we referred to earlier in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Of course, they went, did exactly what he said, and all 120 of those believers in that upper room received the infilling or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the first thing that happened, the very first evidence that they had received the infilling of the Holy Spirit, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now again, I know a lot of things have been done and said in the name of the Holy Spirit that come, came across as just being off the wall and weird. But listen, I, you know, I knew a lot of that stuff growing up, but I was so hungry for God, I just looked past that. I just, you know, I, I wanted God. I knew there was something in that. So, the, so I, I really pursued that. Even with all the, the weird stuff that people did, I knew there was something real to it. Don't throw the baby out in the bathwater just because you have heard or seen or experienced some kind of oddball things in the name of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's not weird. Now, he does do some different things, and it may be strange to a natural-minded person because he's operating at a higher level. But he's not going to just do something to be weird. I can tell you right now. So you need this this infilling so refer to that i'm just giving you that link at the bottom where you can refer to that and go in and receive the infilling of the holy spirit it will be to your advantage i can tell you as it has been to mine all these years i'm a, we're working on 39 years almost since i received the baptism of the holy spirit and that is it was a great momentary thing in my life when i did that it made a big big difference in my life now, let's go back over to Romans chapter 8 today, Romans the 8th chapter, because we want to make some other comments from Romans chapter 8 uh, about this helper and what he's going to do in our life. Now, we, we already read this verse and made some commentary on it, but I'm going to take it just a little bit further today and today's lesson and also in the next lesson. But verse 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses now flash news you know breaking news to all of us you don't know this you do have weakness and bet weaknesses embedded in your natural body in your natural life and in your natural mind you again don't know everything don't see everything uh, your natural senses only contact the natural realm it does not contact at all the spiritual realm unless the spiritual realm manifests in the natural realm so notice that even in our weaknesses, we again have supernatural help. You know, I like to use the illustration when, uh, you know, if, you're, if you've ever seen any of the James Bond movies, they've been around for years. And my wife, is, she really likes James Bond. I watch it too. I enjoy it. But, um, you know, there's one thing about James Bond. When they send him out on a mission, you know, they know there's going to be some hostility, some adversaries trying to, uh, prevent him from fulfilling that mission and so they equip him with the latest technology I mean he's got it in his boat in his car in his briefcase uh, in his shoe no it's not a shoe that was get smart all right but uh, he's got it in his clothes he's got it you know he's got the latest greatest to give him an advantage over those adversaries that are going to try to prevent him from fulfilling his mission well likewise headquarters has equipped us with the Holy Spirit so that we will have the advantage 
in running our race and fulfilling our mission, even though the adversary is going to try everything he can to keep you from fulfilling that mission, we have supernatural uh, gifts, callings. We have supernatural impartations, anointings to us. They are going to help uh, put us over in every situation here. But notice, in even in our own weaknesses, the Holy Spirit also helps in those weaknesses. Now, we pointed out that word in the Greek in the last lesson, that word helps. You know, five-letter word here in, uh, translated in English in our Bibles, but it's a real big, long compound word in the, in the Greek. It's about three miles long, and it just simply means this. It, it means to take hold together with against. So what does the Holy Spirit do? He takes hold with us together, not by himself, not apart from us, together with us against the weaknesses, the limitations of the flesh and of the mind. For what purpose? So that those weaknesses are now swallowed up by his strengths. See, he has strength for all things. The Holy Spirit doesn't have weaknesses like we do. We're the one with weaknesses. He doesn't. But when he comes to take hold together with against those weaknesses, his strengths now just nullify our weaknesses and give us the advantage over the enemy. And of course, you're going to need that. It goes on to say, for we do not know for what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, and, a, and again the Greek says, with groanings which cannot be uttered in articulate speech. And again, we're referring to right here the supernatural prayer language, I like to call it, that he gives us. Now again, this is, uh, you know, is for, this gift of tongues can be used in different ways. It can be used to edify the body in a church service, tongues with interpretation. But Obviously, it's used primarily to our advantage when we use it in a private devotional time in our prayer life. It elevates our prayer life out of just a limited natural prayer up into a supernatural heavenly prayer. Now, it's the Holy Spirit praying through our spirit. In other words, he's giving us the utterance and we're praying the prayer, but the Holy Spirit's giving us the prayer language. He's given us the same things to say. And I like to call it a head bypass operation because it just basically hooks your tongue up with your spirit and your spirit's already hooked up with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's hooked up with heaven. So now this, there's a big loop going on. The, you know, heaven's given the Holy Spirit things to pray supernaturally through us with a supernatural prayer language. And then as we pray it out, it becomes a legal prayer because it's us doing the praying. It is us yielding ourselves to the Holy Ghost. It's us yielding our tongue to the Holy Spirit. And of course, those prayers ascend back to God, creates the loop, completes the loop. And of course, that is a perfect prayer because the Holy Spirit, in verse 27, it says, Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He knows exactly what's in the heart of God. He knows what the plan of God is, the purpose of God is. And now that gives us that ability to pray out something that's beyond our natural limited understanding and our knowledge. Now, eventually it will dawn on you because, you know, the Bible says we looked at it. First Corinthians 14, verse two, he who speaks or prays in an unknown language and an unknown tongue speaks mysteries. And it's, it's not for God's benefit because he knows all this. This is coming from him to begin with. Is for our benefit. I believe as we pray this out and as we allow that expression of that Holy Spirit prayer language to, to break forth through our own language or our own mouth, I believe that it creates a revelation in our own minds to the will and the purpose and plan of God. And see, I tell you, I can, I'm going to give you some illustrations about this today and in the next lesson that are going to really, uh, really going to back this up right here. But you know, this right here just takes us out of just a natural limited prayer life up into a supernatural heavenly prayer life where we have the advantage. Now, I remember a number of years ago, I heard a story, in fact, Brother Hagen, I went to Raymond Bible Training Center, Brother Hagen was there back in the 
80s and teaching us. One of the stories he taught along these lines uh, happened to a missionary couple prior to World War I. And of course, back then, they didn't have the communication, they didn't have the travel advantages we do today, didn't have the medical technology or any of that other stuff. And so they were uh, actually missionaries to some parts of Africa, her and her husband. And uh, over the course of time, um, she, they were over there in the mission field and she contracted uh, a severe, uh, deadly fever that was common you know, to be over in that area during that time. Now at that same time that she was dealing with that, uh, her parents back home over here in the States, they owned and operated a dairy farm. They had scaled it back later in life. But uh, he was the husband, the father of uh, this missionary uh, daughter and, and, and the son-in-law was going out to milk the cows and do some other things. You know, you have to do those real early in the morning by the time the sun comes up. It was about 5.30, I think it was. And on his way to the barn to milk the cows, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit arrested him right there. He dropped his pails. He knew something. He knew the Spirit of God was moving on him. He was Pentecost. He received what I'm talking about here, this infilling of the Holy Spirit. But he also had that working, cooperative partnership with the Holy Spirit. And boy, that came to his advantage this day. But, you know, in that arrest, he knew all of a sudden it had to do with his daughter that was overseas in Africa. And again, they didn't have email, they didn't have cell phones, phones, any of that stuff. It was snail mail and it took about six weeks to get a letter back and forth. So he turned around and went back in the house. And uh, he walked in, his uh, wife was uh, you know, cooking breakfast there. And all of a sudden she looked at him and she said, look, look like you've seen a ghost. And he said, there's something wrong. He said, I, I was on my way out and the Holy Spirit arrested me. I know there's something wrong. I know it's with our daughter overseas, uh, that missionary daughter. And so they just got down in the floor. They didn't know exactly what was going on. They didn't know exactly what the details were in that situation, but they didn't have to. They didn't have to know everything at that time. And so they just began to pray in the Spirit. And they did this for hour after hour. I mean, it was 5.30, 6 o'clock when they started. It was almost two o'clock in the afternoon when finally the husband, the, the father of this child, this missionary daughter, received a note of victory. In other words, there was a song that came up. There's a joy that came up. You know, it's just like a breakthrough on the inside. They've been praying for about eight hours for this. And you know, sometimes you just have to stay with it until you are released from this. Thank God they did this. And they knew that everything was gonna be all right. Well, in the course of time, they received a uh, letter from the uh, from the son-in-law and telling them all about what had happened. You know, that she had contracted this deadly virus or this deadly fever. In fact, she was on her deathbed and to some degree, it looked like uh, uh, apparently she had passed away. And then, then all of a sudden, she just jumped up and he was healed just instantly. And so uh, they had not, told them what had happened to them and they didn't tell them they said they wrote back and said all right you know when did this happen what time what day all this kind of stuff when did all this happen well they finally got the letter back about six weeks later and they started comparing notes and sure enough it was at the exact time when she jumped up heel that was the exact time that they got that note of victory after praying for those eight hours now it doesn't always take eight hours but you know, we're not following formulas here. We're following the leading of the Holy Spirit. And in that situation, what if they hadn't have done that? What if they didn't have the infilling of the Holy Spirit? Well, they may have known something was wrong, but you know, their, uh, their, under, their prayer life would have been limited right there. What if they hadn't have developed a cooperative relationship, partnership with the Holy Spirit and then yielded to him? Well, their daughter may have just gone on and passed away. In fact, probably all indications were that that was, that was happened because there was nothing medically that was done to help her. There was nothing in the natural that happened that raised her back up from that situation. And, uh, you know, there's another story along those lines, and I've got story after story here, but uh, along these lines, we'll share some more in the next lesson. But a number of years ago, probably been 20, 
five years ago or so, our young boys, uh, we had three boys at the time, we later added a daughter, but they were all fairly young. And when I always like going and seeing the vintage World War II airplanes when they came around fairly close. And I particularly like the, the bombers, you know, the B-29s, the B-17s, all those. So we had a, one of the B-17s fly into an airport pretty close to us and I took them over there to see this thing. In fact, we were going to take a tour of it. We were going to go inside of it and I was going to show them, you know, what it looked like and everything. And so we, we were waiting in line and um, got in a conversation with this gentleman in front of me, older gentleman, and uh, found out during the course of that conversation, he had actually flown, I think, 25 missions or so, maybe more than that, at least 25 missions on one of these uh, B-17s. Now that was almost unheard of. They got shot down and everything else. All kinds of things happened to them. And he was in, he was a ball turret. He was the, you know, the guy underneath shooting the guns. He was a, he was the top turret, you know, a guy on top. So he was a big target. He was just kind of a sitting duck sometimes. But uh, I found out he started talking about his mother. His mother, he was from Alabama, and his mother back home in Alabama had made a, had made kind of a pact with the Lord. You know, when he was drafted and went overseas made a pact with uh, with the Lord about, all right, every time he goes on a mission, I want you to wake me up and I'm going to pray until I get a note of victory. Well, this is what she was doing right here, I can tell you. And, uh, of course, they didn't have, they couldn't tell what was going on in these missions. They didn't know when they were going out. They didn't know where they were going, any of those things. And so, sure enough, she'd get up, you know, Holy Spirit would arrest her. She'd get up, she'd pray, pray in the Spirit, do whatever, and then she'd get a note of victory. And she got the diary of this you know, of dates, times, all that kind of stuff with a prayer diary, a journal. And so she began to compare this when he came back home or during the course of, you know, correspondence when they were allowed to talk about these things. They began to compare notes and sure enough, boy, she was right on it. I tell you, every time that he went out, the Holy Spirit would, you know, arrest her, get her involved. She would have to yield, of course, give him the opportunity and uh, then she'd get a note of victory and know he was back home. See that that's supernatural right there. Well, what if what happened if he hadn't if, if she hadn't done that? Well, he probably wouldn't have made 25 missions. I can tell you, 25 missions means somebody was praying somewhere back home for somebody. I can tell you right now on that on those uh, airplanes. Well, I, again, I've just got story after story about this, but you need that advantage. This is going to give you an advantage when you are praying in the Holy Spirit. He's going to help you put you over in every situation. That's all the time I've got for this lesson. If you'd like additional materials and resources, you can always visit us on the web, TonyCowan.org, and we will see you in the next lesson. Hey guys, thank you so much for checking out this video. We hope that it really blessed you. Hope you got a lot out of it. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure you also turn on the notifications so that you get notified whenever we post a new video. Also, go ahead and hit that like button. And if God's doing awesome things in your life like we're believing Him for, then we would love for you to share that with us. So leave us a comment. Let us know all the good things God's doing in your life. We'll see you next time.